Hi, in this video we're having another look at the Fieldtech FY6900 signal generator. Now shortly after releasing the videos where I designed the updated power supply for this unit, there were a few comments which were quite rightly suggesting that this whole solution costs way too much money for this kind of class of signal generator. And that's pretty much true in a way. So I quite like designing these types of projects and I hope that some of you do too, just because it provides you a chance to design and solve a problem that you've come across. However, a completely custom solution such as this isn't necessarily the most cost effective solution. So, you know, although you might learn something from this and uh, enjoy the hobby by building up a PCB with all of the components and bringing it to life, if your main objective is to get a piece of test equipment that's low in cost, then probably building this all into it isn't the best use of your money. And as someone said, like even if you built all of this yourself, you're probably not far off the price of a second-hand piece of equipment on eBay. So what I thought we'd have a little look at today is a potentially much cheaper solution using a couple of power supply modules from IC Station. Now the first one is this power supply module, which is the bulk of you know where the cost would come into typically. This is doing the AC to DC conversion, and this is quite a nice unit if it checks out to be okay. So it takes in your universal input voltage, 110 or 220 volts, and then it's got two channels up to 100 watts output in total. So here you can see uh, the channel one output, 17 to 34 volts at four amps, and channel 2 is the 2 to 32 volts at 5 amps. So you can see here we've got plenty of power for a signal generator. And this is only coming in at about $8.67. Now this doesn't give us our three supply rails. So we could easily use uh, channel output 2 to provide our 5 volt rail. But then we need our plus and minus, I think it was 13 and a half volt rail. So I was thinking what we could do is connect channel 1 into a second module. And this is a... Um, symmetrical DC to DC converter that outputs plus and minus uh, rails. So for example, you could set this to plus or minus 12 volts, plus or minus 13 and a half volts from a single 5 to 24 volts input. So simply putting these two modules inside the device theoretically could give us a potentially much better solution than the stock solution that came in the signal generator. So let's have a closer look at this power supply board. This is the only one that we're going to have a look at in this video because um, I'm quite interested in these types of board. If they turn out to be safe and work well, then actually the cost point is quite effective and could be used in design. So let's have a little look more closely. And basically we've got our AC coming in, a glass fuse and then a suppression capacitor. And then we've got our common mode choke, which is stopping any of this switching noise going back out through our mains power cord and creating emissions in the room. Then we've got a bridge rectifier. We've got an NTC thermistor just to limit the inrush current because we've got a fairly sizable 82 microfarad capacitor here. So that's just limiting the inrush current so that uh, when you plug it in, you don't destroy your socket or your switch um, when you plug it in each time. And then it goes into our switch mode power supply chip. We've got our MOSFET, which is driving the flyback transformer and then a few bits of circuitry associated with it. So we've got our optocoupler, and you will notice that actually the isolation barrier is a little bit close. They've put a slot in, uh, but it could be doing with this a little bit further away from the DC side. But basically we've got our optocoupler, and that's where the isolation sort of ends, through the transformer, and then through our capacitor. So the power supply chip that they've used is a CR68 now I've not come across this particular chip before, but by all accounts it looks like a pretty bog standard switch mode power supply chip for this type of application. So there's not really much to say about them. They are, you know, you're, you can get them from a whole range of brands these days. Typically, for this type of thing, you'd see it from a brand called Power Integrations in a more slightly higher priced device. But certainly, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the one that's picked for this unit, and that's feeding the flyback transformer here and then basically we've got our feedback set by this potentiometer here so output one is always got to be higher than output two and that voltage is set by this potentiometer here 
and then cascaded off this output we've got a secondary book regulator here and this one is the XL Semi XL4015 DC to DC converter it's got a 5 amp switch in it and it's just a standard book regulator and we've got our potentiometer here for setting that second output voltage. If we have a look at the underside you can see the isolation barrier is quite visible so basically it goes through here and then down through the transformer so it's not too bad I think they definitely could have moved this optocoupler just so there was a nice straight line it was quite clear because the distance between here although it's about 10 millimeters it's just a little bit closer than it really needed to be but other than that there's not really much to say on the underside you can see we've got some spark gaps here in case we see um, some high voltages on the input from a surge or something like that a couple of um, you know little arc gaps and there's not really much else to say about the overall design you will notice that there's not a huge amount of gap between this ground plane and some of the tracers but actually as we've shown in a, a previous video that distance once it's covered with the solder mask is actually more than adequate it's very difficult for it to arc over underneath the solder mask so not really any problem there at all so the main thing really is seeing whether this actually behaves as it should do so we're going to tie the DC load to one of the outputs and start loading it up and see if it can actually manage to get close to its rated output power right so we've got a few multimeters connected up to the power supply board so connected to output 1 which is the 17 to 34 volt output we've got these two meters here one measuring voltage and one measuring current and that output is connected to the DC load just sitting to the side here then we've got the MUS tool which is connected to output 2 and at the moment that one has no load connected to it so let's turn it on and see what happens just bearing in mind that once it's powered up sort of half of this is live so we do need to be careful around the power supply let's turn it on and there we go after about a second or so we've got output 2 which is currently set to about 5 volts and output 1 which is set to 18 volts let's tweak the potentiometer and just see what the range actually is so we'll try turning it down it says the minimum is 17 and yeah I think when we go below 17 it looks like it just starts oscillating let's turn it all the way up and there you can see it goes to about 36 volts so we've got a decent range of output voltages there we'll leave it set to about 24 volts for some testing and then it says the output range is up to 4 amps on that channel so we'll turn on the DC load and that's at about 100 milliamps certainly no problems there we'll just grab the infrared thermometer and we'll just uh, periodically check the temperature you can see it's sitting at about 25 yeah about 25 with 2.4 watts being drawn let's turn up the output power so that's about 26 watts and we've got just a little bit of an increase in temperature there let's turn it up to about 50 watts so a bang on 50 watts there just getting a little bit of heating towards the bottom of the board just here you can see uh, it looks like we've got some kind of relatively large SMD resistor down here that seems to be the bit that's getting warm we'll go up to 75 watts we've seen a very marginal decrease in voltage there but don't forget we've got a little bit of voltage drop on these wires certainly nothing too worrying and finally we'll just draw the 4 amps from the output yeah so there's our 4 amps not really any problems so all I've done here is just switched around the output leads so we've now got output number two on the meter here and we'll start drawing some current again so that's one amp it's getting a little bit warm just on the secondary side over here let's turn it up some more four amps and we're seeing a little bit of a drop in output voltage in fact it's slowly declining I'll take it down a bit and see if that recovers yeah it seems to be dropping off quite rapidly after three and a half amps 
and at close to 5 amps were way out of regulation. So certainly not a problem for the signal generator, but the second output doesn't seem to be able to handle much more than about 3 amps. So just in terms of switching noise, I've hooked up the oscilloscope to the output and with no load we're not really seeing too much noise, nothing that we wouldn't expect. But as soon as we start putting a load, this is 100 milliamps, you can see the switching noise here at about 200 kilohertz and already we're seeing about 68 millivolts peak to peak. Let's increase that up to half an amp and now you can see it's getting a little bit noisier so we're actually getting the switching noise of the first switching converter and then in addition we've got the XL Semi DC to DC converter which is contributing additional noise giving us an overall of about 200 millivolts at only half an amp. At one amp we're seeing on average about 450 millivolts peak to peak uh, that's the worst case here. At two amps we're seeing about 1 volt peak to peak in those spikes, so really quite noisy, although the spikes themselves are actually very short in period. So where does that leave us with using this power supply for the waveform generator? Well this is where a few compromises have to be made. So when I designed the PCBs to go in the signal generator, I knew what my specification points needed to be, and therefore the whole design was tailored around those specification points where we're using off-the-shelf parts such as this device, we have to make some compromises because this has been designed as a generic power supply for a whole range of purposes and therefore the operating points can't be optimised. That means that this power supply might actually work better, for example, when it's outputting 30 volts when we actually need it to output uh, 12, for example. Um, you know, there have to be some compromises when you have such a wide output voltage range. So certainly I don't think there's any problem with this power supply as such. Uh, it just ends up not being quite an elegant solution because we're going to need this PCB. Then we're going to need that additional board to give us our plus and minus voltage rails. And then given the output waveforms, it almost certainly looks like we'd need one more board with a whole bank of filters, whether that be a whole bank of capacitors uh, just trying to filter the output or whether we go for some kind of LC filter which is potentially more effective at reducing those high frequency spikes. So anyway, that's just a little look at potentially a much more cost effective solution for your FieldTech FY6900. I'll leave the links to this PCB down below and also the plus and minus voltage rail uh, PCB as well. Thank you to IC Station for sending this board for me to have a little look at. And until next time, thanks for watching.